I'm Angela Falconetti. I serve as the Vice President of Institutional Advancement for Virginia Western and also the Executive Director of the Foundation. And we um, have, have um, acquired support in the form of this endowed lecture series in honor of Mr. Don Smith, who was the previous CEO of Steel Dynamics. And so a major contribution was given, and we now have this opportunity that is alive and well. And uh, Kristen Barrett, who many of you know. How many of you are in Kristen's classes? She's wonderful, isn't she? Okay, you better say that a little louder. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. I know, exactly. No, no, no. She's wonderful. We thank the world of her. Um, she is our first endowed chair at Virginia Western, so in the history of the college, so she's really making a mark. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Kristen. And um, thank you, Jim, who also, by the way, serves on our, f our local board of directors as our chairman and has been very supportive of our educational foundation, but just fundamentally a, a, just a really wonderful human being and, a, and an amazing professional, someone who um, I admire very much, even though he doesn't know that, but dearly, because he's just been so good to this institution and good to the employees of Virginia Western, and now you, the students. He's working very hard to make sure that you have um, an amazing experience here. So, Jim, thank you so much for being with us. And, Kristen, you can take it away. Sure. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. So I just wanted to say a few things. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, I'd like to thank um, Don Smith. Um, and the foundation um, for creating this endowment that makes all this possible. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Career Center for hosting us today. Uh, this really has been a great series. We started last semester, um, and as you all know, those of you that are my students, I'm requiring you to submit something to me about what you've taken away from these. And last semester, I got some great responses. Uh, people came away with um, a lot of meaningful information not necessarily dealing with math, but just dealing with how to be successful in their careers in general. And so that's what I want you guys to be thinking about as you're listening. Um, Mr. McCadden is obviously very successful. He has a great impact um, in the Roanoke Valley, really, in, and beyond up into Richmond. Um, he has a lot of useful information for you guys, not only about just being successful in general, but going from what you're learning in your individual classes, particularly math, right? And how are you gonna apply that when you get into your career? So all of you have in front of you a little bio about Mr. McCadden. I'm not gonna read that to you, but you can look that over. Um, and I will turn it over to him to get started. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, uh, Kristen, Miss Barrett. Um, it's, it's a privilege for me to be here, not only because I, th I believe in what's happening here and what's happening at Virginia Western, but um, I count Don Smith as a good friend, um, and it's, it's great that they're honoring, that he's honoring the institution with this, this series. Um, I will tell you, I've been to several of the, of the presentations before. Um, you're, the bar's been set very high, so today we're going to lower the bar a little bit, um, and we'll, we'll get down. I do have a... Uh, Lengthy presentation, um, which I decided, I told Angela right before I got started that uh, I think I'm going to throw out the notes and we'll just wing it today um, because I think you would probably appreciate that more. Now, I will tell you that when, we, when I agreed to do this, Ms. Barrett sent me a list of things that I'm supposed to talk about, and I'm going to do that right off the bat. I'm going to hit all five things. I'm supposed to give a brief bio of myself. I'm supposed to talk about the importance of mathematics and what I do and, what, and any direct math connections. I'm supposed to talk about the importance of critical thinking, uh, logical reasoning, quantitative reasoning, and problem-solving skills. Um, I'm supposed to talk about what we look for in new employees. Um, and I'm also supposed to talk about job shadowing, internship, and mentoring opportunities that are available within my organization. I will tell you that we are hiring. Um, so if you're looking for a job, um, you've come to the right place. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself uh, very briefly. And the reason I'm going to do this is because I, I firmly believe that it, you need to know where people come from uh, to, to kind of get a background and a base on where, where we start. Um, I was born in San Jose, Costa Rica, uh, the son of missionary parents who were learning to speak Spanish on their way to Bolivia. Uh, I spent the first nine years of my life in the highlands, El Altiplano, the high plains of Bolivia, right below the Andes Mountains, um, in a place where no one had any more than the, the person who has the least in our country has. I mean, we had, people had nothing. Um, and we were there to teach them um, 
uh, about Christianity, or I wasn't there. To, I was there to learn. My parents were there to teach people. Um, we came back to the United States when I was 10 years old. Uh, my father's a uh, Methodist minister, uh, grew up in Richmond, then moved to, to uh, Roanoke, went to Cave Spring High School. Uh, when I graduated from there, I went to Randolph-Macon College, a small liberal arts college right outside of Richmond in Ashland, Virginia. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, you ought to look it up. It's a very nice place, and it's a good place to jump from here to um, if, you'd like, if you'd like that kind of educational background. Um, I got off the bus in Roanoke, so to speak. Dad kept going from church to church all over the state, but uh, I ended up here. Uh, and then after college, came back here and, and went to work for the company that I still work for, Balzer & Associates. Balzer & Associates is a development consulting firm. Uh, we are multidisciplinary. We have sur land surveying, civil engineering, structural engineering, landscape architecture, and architecture. And we have those, we, we provide those services out of five offices across the state of Virginia. We have 100, as of yesterday, 111 employees. Um, we've been as large as 250. We've been as small as nine. So we've been all over the place in terms of size as a result of growth and then contraction during the recession. Um, now we're at 111 people. Um, we have offices in Christiansburg, Roanoke, Stanton, Harrisonburg, and Richmond. So we pretty much cover all of the core of Virginia. Um, the importance of mathematics in what we do, uh, I hope, is obvious. There's not a day that goes by at Balzer & Associates that math and numbers aren't being crunched and crunched and crunched. Uh, specifically, myself as the, as the president and CEO of the company, um, obviously, I'm looking at financial information. Uh, I'm looking at employee information, all of which uh, handle, all of which involve mathematics and and figuring things out. The the more important thing for me is the is the problem solving and critical thinking skills uh, at this point. Now, with our surveyors, our architects, our engineers, math they are math. Everything they do is math. Um, now, I will tell you, you guys are blessed because you're, you're coming up at a time where technology allows a lot of that to be done on a computer or in, a, in, in some other uh, technological way, whereas in the old days, it was all done, you know, very much calculating and doing things like that um, longhand as opposed to. So it's important that you get a, the basic foundation in math um, for anything with regards to our industry. Um, critical thinking, logical reasoning, and quantitative reasoning, and problem solving. There's not a day that goes by that we don't solve problems for people. Um, it's what we do. Um, and I'll tell, I'm going to go through some project examples and tell you a little bit more specifically about our, our various disciplines. Um, what I'm looking for when we're hiring new employees, um, work ethic. Critical work, work ethic is critically important to us because our clients demand that we provide services to them when they need them, um, on time, on budget. And so we need people that have a strong work ethic. We need people who are people people. Um, if you can communicate, if you can be in a social setting and get along with people, then you can succeed in most any, anything you try in life. Um, and then job shadowing, as I've told you, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, we have needs in all of our disciplines, uh, primarily in surveying. Uh, land surveying is a, is, a, is, a, is a profession that has very few avenues to get into it. Uh, there are no colleges or universities in Virginia that offer a land surveying degree. Um, so the closest place we can get graduates is East Tennessee State University. Um, and they graduate about 16 a year. So you can imagine the, the law of supply and demand there. Um, but anyway, so we'll talk more about that as we get into surveying. So what I want to do is walk you through kind of what happens at Balzer & Associates. Um, as I said, we offer all of those disciplines. And our typical, our clients come from all over the place and they can range from someone who just wants us to survey a piece of property to someone who wants us to design and build, uh, design something like this facility. And so it's, it's all over the place in terms of what, you, what, what we get our hands on. Um, but every project starts with an idea. Somebody wants to do something. So we'll kind of go with a, 
how, how would a project start? A client comes in and say they want to build an office building. Um, the first thing we're going to do with them is we're going to go through a financial analysis and a pro forma. Um, so keep that, those words. A pro forma is, is kind of an analysis of whether the project makes sense, uh, a little feasibility, if you will. So what we'll do is we will look at the financial, okay, somebody, I want to build an office building. Okay, first question is, is it for you is it, or is it for you to rent, to own and rent? Um, okay, well, if it's for you, then there's some different parameters in terms of whether, the fee, whether it's feasible or not. But let's say we're going to build a speculative office building to rent to people. Um, so we're going to go with our client through an analysis of the site, the cost of the site, what it's going to cost to develop the site, what it's going to cost to build their building, and then what are the rents that they can get so that we can then determine whether e the project even makes sense from a financial standpoint. Obviously, there are, we always say, um, if you have enough money, you can do whatever you want to do. But typically, our clients are coming to us looking for feasibility. So math comes into it. We're trying to analyze. We're, we're using our problem-solving skills and our critical thinking to analyze whether or not this project even makes sense from the get-go. And if it doesn't, believe it or not, we'll tell them, we don't think this makes sense. Now, there are people who say, well, you would do it anyway. Well, in our firm, we're not. If we don't think a project makes sense for you to do, we're going to tell you. Now, we have clients who sometimes listen, and we have clients who sometimes say, well, I want to do it anyway. And if you want to do it anyway, fine, we'll move ahead, and we're going to do our best to analyze and make sure the project comes out the best for you. But again, starting off from the very beginning, we're going to analyze the project for you because we want our projects to succeed. Because if our projects succeed, you succeed. And if you succeed, you come back. And we do it again. And you tell your friend. And, he, and then he or she comes to us. And so success breeds success. Uh, you've heard that a thousand times, but I'm, I'm here to tell you it works, and it really is true. Um, so let me get a quick drink here. So surveying. Um, land surveying is something probably you never even think about. But every project that's ever built, this building, for example, uh, a surveyor came out here and surveyed this piece of property before the design ever started to determine what's here. What are the existing conditions? And that's done, that used to be done. Let's talk about how that's done. So that nowadays, that's done with this little guy we call a robot. It doesn't look much like a robot, but um, it's an instrument that 10 years ago, that instrument was operated by an instrument operator. And so we would send a survey crew into the field, and we would have an instrument operator, a crew chief, and typically a, what we called a rodman. Uh, through the use of technology today, we can send that robot with one person into the field and they can do the same work that three people did 10 years ago, just e easy, easily. So this, this little guy follows, and I don't have a guy on here, but there's a, there's, a, there's a surveyor out there in the field walking around, and this little guy follows him. When I say follows, he doesn't like actually go on, on wheels and follow him, but he follows him with his beam. Um, to survey the property. So when we're going to survey a piece of property, we're going to go do extensive research in the courthouse. Uh, if, you, if, this, if you start glazing over, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal, but I want you to know where it all. Yes, sir? The robot shoots vectors. That's right. And records those and comes back. I'm just trying to connect. Yep. And Super. The students. Yep. The math that they're doing with Kristen, right? Yep. He's doing a bunch of vector analysis. Absolutely. And it and then coming back and compiling it. Thank you. Um, what you will know is from my liberal arts background, if you have technical questions, you need to ask him because I, I manage architects, engineers, and surveyors. I aren't one, okay? Um, so, uh, so anyway, surveyor goes out and we, what we're trying to determine here is where the property is that we're going to be working on and what that property looks like. Uh, in this area, it's very rare to get a flat piece of property. In Richmond, they have flat pieces of property. Our guys look down there and go, my gosh, that would be so easy to, to, to work with. Um, so anyway, we, we survey the piece of property. Now we take that information back to the office and we create a, a, pl a, pl a three-dimensional or two-dimensional, depending on what we're doing, model of that site 
that now our engineers, so now we, the surveyors have done their part of getting the information. Uh, what are they looking for? Property lines, easements. So if you have a piece of property, there might be an easement that APCO has to run their power line across it. There might be an easement that the city has to run a water line under it. So when you look at a piece of property, you think, oh, that's just a piece of property. There could be all kinds of things going on under and above that piece of property. So again, they're looking for that. We're looking for uh, utility locations. We're looking for floodplains, floodways. You know, is it, is it near a stream that, that the property might flood? So we're looking for those kinds of things. So the surveyors then bring that in. They crunch it and they hand it to our engineers. Okay, so now we get into our civil engineering and let's, let's talk about surveying. Um, I'm gonna show you some projects that we've done here locally um, that have been kind of challenging. And again, realizing that everything needs to be done carefully and computationally. This is a vertical structure plan. How many of you have seen the Hampton Inn downtown on top of the parking garage? Okay, that's a project that we did we didn't design the building, but we did the surveying and engineering. A really challenging project because the city owns the parking garage and they were leasing air rights above the parking garage. So the architects had to design a building to fit on top of an existing parking garage. So we had to go out there and survey it and make sure that we had accurate information to make sure that when they designed and built this hotel on top of it, that it was actually gonna sit where it was supposed to sit. So this is, you can't see very much here, but this is literally the plan, the vertical um, structure plan of the parking garage that we used and then sent to the architects. Um, again, went out in the field, gathered the data, send it to the architects. Um, this is a picture of the vertical, uh, this is the structural alignment between the existing parking deck and then the new construction coming up. So again, very critical that everything line up, match up. So very important mathematical computation, very important when you're in the field getting the correct information about the structure. Jim, I would just add that the building they're in, the same thing happened. This was yes, the top floor, absolutely. And then they added the third floor on top of this floor right. in the building you're in. Yep. When you do that, do you take um, for granted what they give you as the structural bearing capacity? Because of the weight we, bearing, you're, you're going to put a new building on top. I'll so talk about structures here. That, that we, we, well, in this particular case, we were not hired as the structural engineers, but that analysis did happen. What you do is you take the design of the existing structure and then you do some field verification to make sure that it was built as designed uh, because that doesn't always happen as well. We have a project right now we're working on where there's a problem where the design worked but what was constructed in the field wasn't constructed as per plans. And so it's, it's a serious issue. But yeah, we don't take for granted. We'll use what they give us um, as, inf as information to s as a starting point, but then we have to verify that. Uh, and just like this, we, got, we had plans of the parking deck, but we feel verified to make sure that, that the parking deck dimensions, because even if you were off half a foot or less, it would be a serious problem. Um, okay, so now we come into civil. Um, obviously what we're trying to do in, in, in designing a site um, is, is to minimize the overall cost and maximize the development potential. So what that means is we're calculating what, what is the, how can we minimize the cost of developing this site so that, it, so that the cost to the college, the cost to the, the developer, the cost to the owner is minimized and so that we're using as much of the site as possible uh, to meet the needs of, of the ultimate user. Um, so what we do here is we often use complex 3D models to, to balance what we call cut and fill. So let me, let me tell you what cut and fill means. In an area like this, um, we don't have a lot of flat sites. So typically you're gonna have to make the site, either make it flatter or use the building to, to adjust the grade. So the cut is the part where you're cutting off of the slope and moving it over 
and then so you have cut and fill. Is that pretty clear to everybody? I mean, it's a pretty simple concept, but um, so we do a cut and fill analysis, and obviously the, the goal is to balance it so that you have the same amount as, of cut as you do fill so that you don't have to haul material off of the site or bring it onto the site because that's expensive. So in an ideal world, every site balances. That never happens. So, I mean, we try to get there, but um, again, it, you're taking into consideration the cost, and so that's, that's what we're looking for there. Um, the other thing we're looking to, to is managing our land resources. Um, every site creates runoff. When you go from this all having been grass to becoming an asphalt parking lot and it rains, uh, rain acts a lot differently on grass than it does on, a, on an asphalt parking lot. And so we have to take into consideration and, the, and regulations are much, much more uh, stringent now than they were in the past about what you do with the stormwater on your site. And so we have, to, we have to detain it, and we also have to detain it for a period of time to allow nutrients to settle out of it. Um, and so, because what you're concerned about is the amount of water that goes into streams and the quality of the water. So when you're designing a site, you're designing, and, and the stormwater system for it, you're designing for the quantity of water that's coming off and the quality of water that's coming off. And so you'll hear about, if you guys are keeping up with the news, you'll hear a lot about DEQ um, and other regula regulations. Um, the big thing around here, obviously, is trying to protect the Chesapeake Bay and the amount of sediment and nutrient that flows downstream to the Chesapeake Bay. And so we're all, as as a as a as a industry um, and as local government, we're all doing the best that we can to try to minimize the impact uh, on streams and the quality of our waters. And um, and you can tell over the years. Uh, if you look at the Roanoke River, for example, there's been a lot done to clean up the Roanoke River, especially given the fact that so much is happening with greenways and people are on the river so much. Uh, so you want to make preserve that as best you can. Um, so let's talk about um, a couple projects. This is um, this is a pro this is, this is a site plan. This is a uh, pre-visualized site plan of. This site is in Salem, uh, in front of the Salem Civic Center. You may have heard there's going to be a hotel and a restaurant there. Um, well, this is the, our preliminary design for that hotel and restaurant site. Um, and so what we're looking for here is making sure that we're, we're taking care of the locality requirements, we're taking care of our clients' requirements, um, and we're managing our stormwater there on site. This is a visualization that we did for a client out in Franklin County. Um, and here we were looking at an industrial park. This is where we bring in a 3D model, um, as I said. And what we're looking for here is the best way to, to lay out this site in order to accommodate industrial users. Um, the roadway, various buildings, and again, this is very preliminary. What we're trying to do here is just find the best way to grade the site, to balance the site, to get access to the site for the potential users coming down the road. Um, so then you go from there to, this is your math. This is where you're doing all your calculations. This is a cut fill report over here. You're calculating the cut and fill on the site, trying to get to a balanced situation. Hydraulic grade line calculations for a 10 year storm for um, stormwater management. Um, and then a storm sewer design. And again, you can see all, all of this involves numbers, calculations, and math. Miss Barrett, this is all you. I love it. <laughs> um, again, proposed grading and graphics calculations for stormwater management. Uh, again, stormwater management, I, I apologize for repeating it, but like right now, that's the biggest thing we deal with on a site. And so you have to calculate the area of the site um, and then determine how you're going to how you're going to keep the stormwater on the site uh, and get it off at a rate that's that's allowed by the regulations um, and that makes good planning sense. Um, uh, how many of you have seen Haley Toyota on 581? This is the site plan for that. Um, again, 
The, the challenges there were, uh, you may remember, that was an old uh, brownfield site of the city, so we had to be careful from an environmental standpoint what we did on the site. Um, we also had to, obviously it's a car dealer, so visibility was very important to them, so we had to make sure that we did design the site in such a way that we allowed for the highest visibility from 581, because that's really their advertising. Um, I will tell you, we can't take credit for the Roanoke and the Rock on the, on the hill. Uh, that was totally uh, their idea, uh, but it was brilliant, um, and it, it was a great use of a, of a hillside. Um, and so again, creativity and thinking of, okay, there's a potential problem slope, what do we do with it? And they came up with a really creative solution. So creative thinking, problem solving um, happens every day. So that, that's the site as it was being built. Um, what, what's here is we had, at this point, we had the parking lot installed. You'll see stakes over here. Um, those stakes are for st staking sidewalk and stormwater. So again, our survey crew has been out there and they've staked where the utilities, where the improvements are gonna go. Um, and that's really critical because those stakes are used to build it. And so if we make a mistake, it's not gonna turn out very well. Um, you guys are welcome to ask questions as I go along here. Um, okay, now let's go to architecture. So engineers and surveyors are real, real number crunchers, okay? I mean, that's what they do every day is, is crunch numbers. Architects are artists. They use math and they have to get it right in terms of once, but they start out very much um, as artists. Uh, if, if you're interested in architecture and you go to architecture school, uh, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have really good grounding in the mathematics, but you're also going to do a lot of art, art history, um, and things like that because that's where the, the creative, creative juices start flowing from, from the architect. So uh, if you ever want to have a really good time, come to my office and I'll put you in a meeting between an architect and an en engineer. It's really exciting because... If the world was designed by architects and if subdivisions and roads were all designed by architects, they would all do this, okay? If they were designed by engineers, they would all go just like this, you know, straight lines, right angles, that, that's all you do. So um, it's interesting to, uh, to work, uh, and I have the pr privilege and pleasure of doing that every day and, and trying to coordinate the, the, the various views. But, but we believe uh, in our shop that, that that that's how the client gets the best, best value, is that they get the input and the critical thinking skills and the talent of people who are looking at it from a very, very mathematical perspective and people who are looking at it from a, hey, it, sh it should be more important what it looks like. And usually we end up marrying the two somewhere in the middle. Um, if we have a client who's very much artistically inclined, then we may end up more towards the artistic side. If we have a client who's like, I don't care what it looks like, I want it to be built as cheap and re efficiently as possible, then you'll have a very stark, plain building. And now you've got the secret, you can ride around town and you can see who, you can look at the designs and you'll be able to tell what was important to the people who designed it and built it. Um, now I will tell you as the architects, um, we have to do what the client wants us to do. Um, and so we can, we can give suggestions to the client, but it's ultimately the client's money. Um, so um, if you see a building that we did and you don't like it, it's because the client made us do it that way. <laughs> um, so let's talk about a couple of projects. Um, my architects always tell me form follows function. So in other words, a building ends up looking like what needs to happen in it. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, we, we do, I mean, there are people who, there are, there are times when you just differ in opinion, um, and I mean, let's face it, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, I mean, you and I could look at a building and we could agree strongly or disagree strongly about whether it's a good, good looking building. Um, but yeah, we have clients who have said, no, I want to do this, and it's turned out well. Um, so yeah, we're, believe me, we're not always right. And if any of you think that you're always going to be right, trust me, it doesn't happen that way. Okay, so uh, 
there's a project in downtown Roanoke, um, Grand Mercy Row. I don't know if you know it. It's down on the corner of Jefferson and Tazewell, I guess. Uh, it used to be a parking lot, Roanoke City parking lot. It's right next to the parking garage. Um, it's next to, it's between the Firestone and the parking garage um, on Williamson. Um, not Jefferson, Williamson, I'm sorry. Uh, I did confuse everyone. Um, so that building was a client who came to us and said he wanted to build something uh, new that looked like it had always been in Roanoke, or, or at least gave honor and homage to the kinds of buildings you would see in downtown Roanoke. Um, it's a mixed-use development. It has residential above, and it has commercial retail on, on the bottom. Um, so a pride client comes in with an idea like that, and where, where we start out is with sketches. I mean, this is literally just sketches of, okay, he wants it to look like a bunch of different buildings, not just one building, so it has several different facades. Um, this is a sketch of the, of the uh, floor plan, so we need to know, we need to know what's gonna, what, what do you want the building to look like and what's it going to be used for. Um, and then you have to realize, as I said, form follows function, but form also follows funding. So, as I said from the beginning, if you have all the money in the world, you can make it look however you want to look. If you, if you have a budget, then we have to look at, um, you know, fancy building outside exteriors cost money. Um, and so we have to look at how, what's the best way to blend the look and the budget. Um, so. What's the usual budget range? Um, it's all over the place. Um, nowadays, if for a building like that, I would, I would guess, and I'm guessing right now, um, you would be in the 200 to 300 dollars a square foot range. Uh, to build a house today, it's going to be 150 to 250. Um, now you can do, you can find houses that are built for less than that. You can find houses that are built for a lot more than that. Um, Angela, do you remember how much it was for this? I, that's right? what I was trying to I think. Did. So the new stand building that's going to be in the parking lot is thirty-five million. Yeah. The, the Fralin Center right. was a little more than that. I think like forty-five million. Yeah. Where, this was about eighteen million for the renovation. Okay. So about right. Yeah. I think the first right. Mm -hmm. That gives you some more. Yeah. Yeah. So he's not talking thousands. That's right. That's yeah. Point. No. 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 You're. T yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about a building. Like that's when I was using square footage. I mean, obviously, you got to multiply that times 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 square feet. Um, yeah, buildings like these are multi, multi million dollar projects. Absolutely. Um, so, anyway, so we have the, the renderings and the floor plans. And then what the other thing we'll do, again, I'll give you a different example. Um, so, so this is a, a private school that we're looking at doing some, an addition to a, to a building. Uh, so we'll do, for them, we'll write a written report. Okay, here's what you have. We'll do an inventory and analysis of what they have, exactly what was done for this building. They looked at what we have, what do we need, how much do we need, how much square footage do we need based on the use, and then we'll come up with some, this is again, just a sketch, just to show you what it, visualize what it could look like. Um, technology has really helped us with this. This used to all be done by hand. Um, and so now we can show it to a client and if they like it, good. If they don't like it, we can fairly quickly make the adjustments they want. Hey, I'd like to see that with a red roof or hey, I'd like to see that with you know, a different layout. And we can make those changes. Now, we can't do them like they do on HGTV. I'm telling you, that's, it doesn't happen in an hour. In an hour or a half hour as it does on that show. Um, and, and it's funny because as that, as that has gained popularity, we have clients come in all the time and say, well, can't you just do like they do on HGTV and like we can do a walkthrough and a flyover and all that? We can do that, but it's gonna cost a lot of time and a lot of money. So, um, but that's getting better and better. But again, so that's, again, again just to, to come back to what Ms. Baird's trying to get us to talk about here is Problem solving, number crunching, um, you know, critical thinking, being able to communicate with your client and talk about what it is that they want to achieve. What we're doing is we're helping our clients realize their dreams. And so 
It's their dream, it's your dream. If you come to us as a client, it's your dream, it's not ours. We just want to help you achieve the dream. And so that's how we guide you through that process. Um, this is, um, again, now this one is, this was a very early crude sketch. We had a client outside of Charlottesville came to us and wanted to do, they had a go golf course and they wanted to do a clubhouse. They were, their clubhouse was a trailer, a uh, golf trailer, I mean a office trailer. And so they, want, they had gotten to a point where they wanted to build a clubhouse. So they came to us and we just did a rough sketch of what they, what they thought they wanted. Uh, again, they tell us, you know, how many people are going to use it? How big is it? How big do you want it to be? What do you want to have in there? Do you need a meeting room? Do you need a bar, a restaurant? What are the things you need in there? So we put all that together, come up with a concept. And then we said, they said, okay, we like that. We want to move forward, but we want something that we can show our members to get them excited about it and raise money to build it. So then we did a, a more graphic depiction of it, a, you know, a full-blown rendering of, hey, here's what it's going to look like. And you can look at these afterwards if you want to come up here and look at them. Um, so they raised the money, they got it done, and there it is. So sketch, cons you know, sketch, rendering, reality. And that's the, that's the magic, that's the magic at what we do. I mean, that's where it all happens. When you can meet with somebody and have that idea, then have somebody render it, and then go down and have lunch in the clubhouse, um, we do that every day, and that's what makes us excited about what we do. Yes, sir? About how long from that picture to that picture? <laughs> in this, uh, again, as with prices, yeah. it can range all over the place. Um, this particular project uh, was about two years from there to there, uh, which isn't bad. Um, we've done them. I mean, we've, we've had clients. We had a client recently who came in um, and wanted to build a... 200,000 square foot op, uh, manufacturing facility and they wanted to be operational in, in 18 months and we haven't even started, we haven't even surveyed the piece of property. Um, now, if you can get the team together, you can make it happen. But it really takes, really takes a lot of coordinated effort. Um, really takes a lot of coordinated effort. Um, Okay, I think that ends up our architecture. Um, and again, around town, it, it's exciting for me to drive around town, to drive around Virginia and look at things that we did um, because it's just exciting when you see, and it's not that it's we did it, it's that we were part of it. We were part of the team uh, because as I said from the beginning, it starts with the client's idea, it's not our idea. Somebody comes up with a great idea and we just do our best to help them fulfill that dream. Yes, ma'am. A lot of students, when they think of engineering, they think of mechanical engineering, some industrial kind of manufacturing. Um, could you speak to the, the disciplines of engineering that you would have outside of, so you talked about the land surveying and the um, civil, but in a building? Yeah. Um, actually, my next topic is structural engineering, but, but yeah, in a building, you're typically going to have... Uh, you're going to have a civil engineer to do the site. You're going to have a structural engineer um, who's going to design. Once the architect has designed the building, the structural engineer is going to design what makes that building stand up and what keeps it there for years and years. Um, we always say in our shop, that in our business, the structural engineer is the guy that you want to be conservative and you want to be right all the time. Because when and this is really oversimplification, but when structural engineers make mistakes, bad things happen. And so you, those guys are, you know, they're, they're, they're putting together the structure that makes it all stand up. Structural engineers do bridges, you know, the, the bridge that goes across Colonial Avenue. Structural engineers spend a lot of time figuring that out because they had to, and, and you have to calculate for all kinds of variables because you don't know how many people because I know you college guys, and you're going to see how many people you can put on that bridge and jump up and down. And that's a strike structural engineer's nightmare because it's like, oh, my gosh. So when you read about structural engineering collapses, I mean, it's always a big deal. It's in the news. People get hurt. So um, 
So structural engineering, civil engineering, structural engineering, mechanical engineering, they're dealing with the uh, heating, air conditioning. Um, so all these vents that are in here, you can blame those on the mechanical engineers. And if you ever want to see a really good fight, get an architect and a mechanical engineer together because the architect says, I don't want to see duct work. I don't want to see ducts. So a few years ago, a bunch of years ago, they finally got together and said, wait a minute, maybe we can make ducts part of the architecture. So now when you go into buildings and they have the exposed duct work, that's because the architects and engineers compromised and said, okay, we're not going to hide this stuff. We'll use it architecturally. Um, and then you're going to have electrical engineers. And those electrical engineers are going to handle the outlets, the lights, the, and, and they too can get into some interesting conversations with, with architects because the architect is all about what it looks like. And so as soon as I have to put lights on it, well, now I'm worried about what they look like. So it, it's an interesting team of approach. Now, we don't have in-house uh, mechanical and electrical engineers, but we work with consultants on a regular basis there in our office every day um, uh, working on the building. So structural, mechanical, electrical, uh, and civil would be the engineers. Um, so any of those, any of those uh, disciplines would be involved in all of these projects. Um, so let's talk about structural engineers. Um, there's only one force that we deal with uh, that's, that we can't mitigate for, and that's gravity. Uh, gravity is gravity. You've all learned about it. If you've been hit on the head by something, you know about it. Uh, but the reality is we can mitigate for light. We can mitigate for sound. We can mitigate for electricity radiation, we can, we can really do things in a building uh, to mitigate for all of that. But at the, at the end of the day, gravity rules. Um, so what you do is when you're going to design a building and when you're going to build a building is you calculate the loads of the building. And the loads are basically what are all the things that are going to, that are going to go into the building. And you have, you have fixed, fixed loads and you have variable loads. So your fixed loads are like furniture. It's not going anywhere. It's going to sit there. Your mechanical units on the roof, your heating and air conditioning units, they're going to sit there. They're not going anywhere. But then you've got the movable loads like you guys, and those are the things that are tough to calculate for because, you know, this room may be designed for 50 people, but who's to say you're not going to put 150 in here? Uh, you know, stadiums. You, you know, a stadium, go to Virginia Tech and stand in the end zone on those, those bleachers, and then all of a sudden everyone starts jumping up and down. That, night, that structure engineer is having nightmares because he's like, oh my gosh, did I allow for 5,000 people to jump up and down in unison on these bleachers? So um, one thing you will learn with structural engineers, they do tend to be a little conservative, and sometimes we have to encourage them along to say, hey, you know, we don't have to design it for a million people to stand on there. Let's go down to, you know, 500,000. So, uh, but anyway, and then the other thing about structural engineering is cost, because structure is expensive. And so, and building structure takes time. And in our industry, time is money. So you've got to figure, a good engineer kind of looks at how do we streamline the structure to get it right where it needs to be without overdoing it, and how do we, how do we design it in such a way that it can build, be built quickly and efficiently? Um, and so good structural engineers get it, and they, they make that happen. Um, and there's some very good structural engineers uh, in Roanoke uh, and, and in Virginia, for that matter. Um, so we like, we like having that in-house so that we can kind of monitor and control the structural part of the building makes it a lot easier for them to work together uh, when they're right there beside each other. Um, and so we run into structures with not only buildings, but bridges. Uh, we don't do a lot of major bridge design, but we do some small bridge design. Uh, retaining walls uh, on a campus like this, there are quite a few retaining walls. An engineer designed every one of those to make sure that it would stay up. Um, and you've all seen failures of retaining walls, especially in Roanoke. The segmental retaining walls that are really popular right now, uh, the one over on 419 next to Tanglewood, I'm sure you've seen it when it collapsed. Uh, again, that failure was a result of, it wasn't the design of the wall. The failure was a result of water coming in behind the wall. 
um, and it just couldn't, it, it wasn't designed to support that quantity of water coming through there. Um, but again, those are, those are things that lessons learned and, and you calculate them and you, you do the best you can um, as a professional. Um, so we'll look at a couple of things. Um, and structural engineering, if, if you're into structural engineering, this will be really exciting. If you're not, this will be really boring. Um, so, because this is the part of a building you never see because it's buried. Okay, so this is the grade beams for that Grand Mercy Row project we sh I showed you that we designed. Um, so what you've got is you've got concrete and reinforcing reinforcement bar. So rebar, you'll see rebar all over the place and you wonder, what's that for? Well, it's reinforcing that concrete. And those aren't just random. That amount of reinforcing, reinforcing bars and where it's located and how it's located, that's all been designed by an engineer. Um, and uh, Grand Mercy was an interesting situation, again, problem solving. We had a site, it was real, very flat, it was, I mean, it was a parking lot. It was an easy site until we did some investigation as to what was under it. Well, under that building are a number of very large storm pipes. So there's storm water running under that building from up, up in the city, okay? So now we've, we can't just put our footings in the ground, you know, our big box in the ground and build a building on it. We've got to span those pipes so, because those pipes can't support the building. So that was a very interesting design. Um, and then this is the final slab and the new concrete columns. So the, the slab's poured, and now the columns start coming up out of there. And those columns are what will support the building that's going to be built on top. So after seeing today's presentation, you're going to have a really cool opportunity, if you're around here for a while, to see this the construction that's going to happen right down the road here. That for Virginia Western, and you'll be able to see this happen, and you'll go, oh, I, I remember that. <laughs> so now you know. Uh, so that. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. In regard to Gramercy Row, the train tracks yes. carrying train cars yes. rumbling. Yes. How do you take into account that motion, or did did your engineers need to take? Into yes. Account? Yeah, they'll take into account anything that's that's that close to the to the building. Um, in that particular case, um, we had we designed for that vibration, uh, but you're not going to eliminate it. I mean, it's it's going to be there, but yeah, you do have to take that into account. Anything that's going to affect that site from a noise, wind, um, the the various you know the seismic seismic. Uh, si in in this area, it's not that big a deal. But if you're in if you're designing in California. You've got to design for earthquakes. If you're designing in Florida, you've got to design for wind. Um, we're blessed around here. We have we have to design for some of that, but it's not near what they have to deal with. But yeah, that's taken into consideration and the for and the structural engineer and also for the building itself. We had to, we have to ask your owner: Is it important? How important it is is it to diffuse that noise? Um, and so and then design for that. Uh, both in the structure and in the, in the shell of the building. Um, so that's the building as it came up. Now that building is an interesting, it's, it's, a, it's called a podium slab, it's a podium design. So what happens is that building has parking under it. So you have a structure you build up and then you create a podium that then the building is built on top of. Um, and so again, an interesting design. If you're downtown, walk around. You can walk underneath. You can see that there's parking underneath it. Then there's an office comp uh, there's an office comp component to it, and then the residential is above it. Are we okay on time? I don't. We have about ten minutes. Okay. Sorry, I'll get out of here. I'll make it quick. Okay. Then this is a building out in uh, Botetourt County. Uh, the localities of the valley got together, and the Roanoke Regional Partnership. And they're doing something really uh, looking forward, uh, building a shell building that it, that's a building, it's a shell uh, for a potential user so that if somebody comes to the Roanoke Valley and wants to locate a business here, the biggest component to getting that to happen is time. So if you have a building already ready, then you're much more likely to get that. And in fact, this building is being looked at by a number of people as we speak. So, uh, but again, that shows you that's the structure, that's the part you never think about. You know, that's the ugly, nasty part that's hidden 
behind all the thing, beautiful things that the architects do. Um, and as you look at this building, you can look right over there. I may be mistaken, but that's probably a column, structural column right there. Um, uh, if, it, if not, it's a ductwork chase for the, for the mechanical electrical, but I, I, would, I would guess it's a structural column. But again, those are the things you don't want to see, but that's what a building structure looks like. Um, and that's a 100,000 square foot building. Um, so, how does a guy like me that started out in Bolivia, um, went to a liberal arts college, end up running an architectural and engineering firm? You work hard, you play hard, you get along with people, um, and it's all, about, it's all about managing people, it's all about helping people ex achieve their dreams. Um, each of you has a dream, uh, pursue it, chase it, but just realize it's not going to be given to you. You got to work for it. Um, and uh, I honestly, any of you who are interested in our, in our field, uh, we, we do job shadowing, we do internships. Uh, we'd love to have anyone who's interested in pursuing land surveying. Um, it's a great career, especially if you like the outdoors, because you work outdoors all the time until you kind of decide you want to come in the office, but um, it's a great place to start. Uh, we'd be happy to have any of you uh, come check out our, our office here in Roanoke um, and uh, visit with us. And if that, if that has anything to do with what you want to do, um, and if not, when you decide someday to become a developer or you want to build a building or whatever, you know where we are. We'd be happy to help you make your dreams come true. Thanks again for the honor. Yes, ma'am. I have a quick question. We also have several students in here that are in business administration. Okay. And so can you speak to the business side of your company? Even Absolutely. Though this is what you do, I'm sure you have accounting, marketing, and all of those <clears throat> other Absolutely. majors as well. um, Yes, we have... In our, in our, obviously in our company, we have people that have to uh, keep up with the numbers. Um, they have to run the business um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, great opportunities for that. And, and as I said, we do the architecture, engineering, and surveying, but inside of our organization, there's the heart of the organization that makes sure that those people can do what they do on a daily basis without having to worry about the business side of it. And so, um, you know, and, and also getting involved in the business side of it is also a way to get to the, the higher levels within the organization. You don't have to be an architect or an engineer to, to be the president of the company. Um, I'm proof of that. So. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think it's, it's really important. Um, you know, our accountants work, I mean, obviously when we, we do a project, the only way we make money is to keep a record of the, t we're selling time. That's all we, we sell a service, it's time. And so we have to account for that time, we have to keep track of that time, we have to bill our clients for that time, and we have to collect for that time. And so we have a staff of people whose job it is to take all that information, take the time records, turn them into invoices, and deal with our clients on a regular basis to make sure we get paid so that we can succeed uh, from a financial perspective. We have time for one more question. We have three minutes. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, on that note, on the end note there, the business side, as far as taking, like, when you were in our shoes, are there any, like, specific classes or anything that you could suggest that aren't necessarily directly related to, like, a degree in which you got that, but in some way directly uh, was related to, like, maybe your success or something? Um, I would, <coughs> again, I'm, I come from a liberal arts background, so I didn't specialize. I mean, math was not my forte. Don't tell her that. Uh, math was not my forte, but I use it and I understand it and I have to deal with it and I have to deal with people who are really, really math geeks. Um, but um, public speaking, and I don't necessarily, I'm not saying I do a good job of it, but, but you have to be able to speak. Um, and, and interpersonal skill, things that, that will help you deal with other people. Um, I think it's always good to have business. Um, regardless of what you do, it's good to know how the business operates, what makes it work. Um, so I think well-rounded, you know, don't just focus on, I mean, while math may be the thing, make sure you also take some other things. Um, I think it's good to, to, English is a good, you know, it's good to be able to speak and understand and write. Uh, a big part of my day is communicating with people. 
you know, writing, cor corresponding with people. Used to be letters, now it's email and all that stuff. But, um, but yeah, I, I think diversify yourself somewhat. I mean, don't just concentrate on one thing, but um, I think any of those things. Foreign languages, I mean, let's face it, in the future, Spanish is going to be a, I consider myself lucky that I got it when I was a kid. I don't use it that much, but boy, when you need it, it's nice to have it. Um, so, um, I have some hats, and I was supposed to throw them to people as they ask questions. Um, so I'll just leave them here, and if you ask the question, get a hat. These are, these are very plain, so you don't have to, but you are advertising us in the back. Um, I've got some different colors, so if you ask the question, feel free to take one. Again, thank you very much, and uh, there's nothing else. I'm happy to stick around if anybody has any personal que I mean, questions you want to ask without ask asking in front of everybody. <laughs> thank you. So I'll um, wrap up really quickly. Thank you so much, Mr. McCann. And I would say one thing that I definitely heard were all of those details lots and lots of details that have to be put together and how accurately and precisely they have to be put together to make something work, right? Yep. And when you get on that kind of scale, it's very important. So yes, those little negatives, they make a big difference and they matter, right? And you've got to make sure that you, uh, that you take all of that into, into account and can consider all of the details in order to make something successful.